Menexenos. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jeffrey Edwards. Menexenos by Plato. Translated by Benjamin Joet. Persons of the Dialogue. Socrates and Menexenus. Socrates. Whence came you, Menexenus? Are you from the Agora? Menexenus. Yes, Socrates, I have been at the council. Socrates. And what might you be doing at the council? And yet I need hardly ask, for I see that you, believing yourself to have arrived at the end of education and of philosophy, and to have had enough of them, are mounting upwards to things higher still, and, though rather young for the post, are intending to govern us elder men, like the rest of your family, which has always provided some one who kindly took care of us. Menexenus. Yes, Socrates, I shall be ready to hold office if you allow and advise that I should, but not if you think otherwise. I went to the council chamber because I heard that the council was about to choose some one who was to speak over the dead, for you know that there is to be a public funeral? Socrates. Yes, I know. And whom did they choose? Menexenus. No one. They delayed the election until tomorrow, but I believe that either Archinos or Dion will be chosen. Socrates. Oh, Menexenus. Death in battle is certainly in many respects a noble thing. The dead man gets a fine and costly funeral, although he may have been poor, and an elaborate speech is made over him by a wise man who has long ago prepared what he has to say, although he who is praised may not have been good for much. The speakers praise him for what he has done, and for what he has not done. That is the beauty of them, and they steal away our souls with their embellished words. In every conceivable form they praise the city, and they praise those who died in war, and all our ancestors who went before us, and they praise ourselves also who are still alive, until I feel quite elevated by their laudations, and I stand listening to their words, Menexenos, and become enchanted by them, and all in a moment I imagine myself to have become a greater and nobler and finer man than I was before." and if, as often happens, there are any foreigners who accompany me to the speech, I become suddenly conscious of having a sort of triumph over them, and they seem to experience a corresponding feeling of admiration at me, and at the greatness of the city, which appears to them, when they are under the influence of the speaker, more wonderful than ever. This consciousness of dignity lasts me more than three days, and not until the fourth or fifth day do I come to my senses, and know where I am. In the meantime, I have been living in the islands of the blessed. Such is the art of our rhetoricians, and in such manner does the sound of their words keep ringing in my ears. Menexenus. You are always making fun of the rhetorician, Socrates. This time, however, I am inclined to think that the speaker who is chosen will not have much to say, for he has been called upon to speak at a moment's notice, and he will be compelled almost to improvise. Socrates. But, why, my friend, should he not have plenty to say? Every rhetorician has speeches ready-made, nor is there any difficulty in improvising that sort of stuff. Had the orator to praise Athenians among Peloponnesians, or Peloponnesians among Athenians, he would be a good rhetorician who could succeed and gain credit. But there is no difficulty in a man's winning applause when he is contending for fame among the persons whom he is praising. Menexenus. Do you think not, Socrates? Socrates. Certainly not. Menexenus. Do you think that you could speak yourself if there should be a necessity, and if the council were to choose you? Socrates. That I should be able to speak is no great wonder, Menexenus, considering that I have an excellent mistress in the art of rhetoric she who has made so many good speakers, and one who was the best among all the Hellenes, Pericles, the son of Xanthippus. Menexenus, and who is she? I suppose that you mean Aspasia. Socrates, yes I do, and besides her I had Conos, the son of Metrobius, as a master, and 
he was my master in music as she was in rhetoric no wonder that a man who has received such an education should be a finished speaker even the pupil of very inferior masters say for example one who had learned music of lampros and rhetoric of antiphon the ramnosian might make a figure if he were to praise the athenians among the athenians menexenus and what would you be able to say if you had to speak socrates of my own wit most likely nothing but yesterday i heard aspasia composing a funeral oration about these very dead for she had been told as you were saying that the athenians were going to choose a speaker and she repeated to me the sort of speech which he should deliver partly improvising and partly from previous thought putting together fragments of the funeral oration which pericles spoke but which as i believe she composed menexenus and can you remember what aspasia said socrates i ought to be able for she taught me and she was ready to strike me because i was always forgetting menexenus then why will you not rehearse what she said socrates because i am afraid that my mistress may be angry with me if i publish her speech menexenus nay socrates let us have the speech whether aspasia's or any one else's no matter i hope that you will oblige me socrates but i am afraid that you will laugh at me if i continue the games of youth in old age menexenus far otherwise socrates let us by all means have the speech socrates truly i have such a disposition to oblige you that if you bid me dance naked i should not like to refuse since we are alone listen then if i remember rightly she began as follows with the mention of the dead there is a tribute of deeds and of words the departed have already had the first when going forth on their destined journey they were attended on their way by the state and by their friends the tribute of words remains to be given to them as is meet and by law ordained for noble words are a memorial and a crown of noble actions which are given to the doers of them by the hearers a word is needed which will duly praise the dead and gently admonish the living exhorting the brethren and descendants of the departed to imitate their virtue and consoling their fathers and mothers and the survivors if any who may chance to be alive of the previous generation what sort of a word will this be and how shall we rightly begin the praises of these brave men in their life they rejoiced their own friends with their valour and their death they gave in exchange for the salvation of the living and i think that we should praise them in the order in which nature made them good for they were good because they were sprung from good fathers wherefore let us first of all praise the goodness of their birth secondly their nurture and education and then let us set forth how noble their actions were and how worthy of the education which they had received and first as to their birth their ancestors were not strangers nor are these their descendants sojourners only whose fathers have come from another country but they are the children of the soil dwelling and living in their own land and the country which brought them up is not like other countries a stepmother to her children but their own true mother she bore them and nourished them and received them and in her bosom they now repose it is meet and right therefore that we should begin by praising the land which is their mother and that will be a way of praising their noble birth the country is worthy to be praised not only by us but by all mankind first and above all as being dear to the gods this is proved by the strife and contention of the gods respecting her and ought not the country which the gods praise to be praised by all mankind the second praise which may be fairly claimed by her is that at the time when the whole earth was sending forth and creating diverse animals tame and wild she our mother was free and pure from savage monsters and out of all animals selected and brought forth man who is superior to the rest in understanding and alone has justice and religion and a great proof that she brought forth the common ancestors of us and of the departed is that she provided the means of support for her offspring 
for as a woman proves her motherhood by giving milk to her young ones, and she who has no fountain of milk is not a mother, so did this our land prove that she was the mother of men, for in those days she alone, and first of all, brought forth wheat and barley for human food, which is the best and noblest sustenance for man, whom she regarded as her true offspring, and these are truer proofs of motherhood in a country than in a woman, for the woman in her conception and generation is but the imitation of the earth, and not the earth of the woman. And of the fruit of the earth she gave a plenteous supply, not only to her own, but to others also. And afterwards she made the olive to spring up to be a boon to her children, and to help them in their toils. And when she had herself nursed them, and brought them up to manhood, she gave them gods to be their rulers and teachers, whose names are well known, and need not now be repeated. They are the gods who first ordered our lives, and instructed us in the arts for the supply of our daily needs, and taught us the acquisition and use of arms for the defense of the country. Thus born into the world, and thus educated, the ancestors of the departed lived, and made themselves a government, which I ought briefly to commemorate. For government is the nurture of man, and the government of good men is good, and of bad men bad. And I must show that our ancestors were trained under a good government, and for this reason they were good, and our contemporaries are also good, among whom our departed friends are to be reckoned. Then, as now, and indeed always, from that time to this, speaking generally, our government was an aristocracy, a form of government which receives various names according to the fancies of men, and is sometimes called democracy, but is really an aristocracy or government of the best which has the approval of the many. For kings we have always had, first hereditary and then elected, and authority is mostly in the hands of the people, who dispense offices and power to those who appear to be most deserving of them. Neither is a man rejected from weakness or poverty or obscurity of origin, nor honored by reason of the opposite, as in other states. But there is one principle. He who appears to be wise and good is a governor and ruler. The basis of this our government is equality of birth, for other states are made up of all sorts and unequal conditions of men, and therefore their governments are unequal. There are tyrannies, and there are oligarchies, in which the one party are slaves, and the other masters, but we and our citizens are brethren, the children all of one mother, and we do not think it right to be one another's masters or servants. But the natural equality of birth compels us to seek for legal equality, and to recognize no superiority except in the reputation of virtue and wisdom. And so, there and our fathers, and these too, our brethren, being nobly born and having been brought up in all freedom, did both in their public and private capacity many noble deeds famous over the whole world. They were the deeds of men who thought that they ought to fight both against Hellenes, for the sake of Hellenes, on behalf of freedom, and against barbarians in the common interest of Hellas. Time would fail me to tell of their defense of their country against the invasion of Eumolpus and the Amazons, or of their defense of the Argives against the Cadmians, or of the Heraclides against the Argives. Besides, the poets have already declared in song to all mankind their glory, and therefore any commemoration of their deeds in prose which we might attempt would hold a second place. They already have their reward, and I say no more of them, but there are other worthy deeds of which no poet has worthily sung, and which are still wooing the poet's muse. Of these I am bound to make honorable mention, and shall invoke others to sing of them also in lyric and other strains, in a manner becoming the actors. And first I will tell how the Persians, lords of Asia, were enslaving Europe, and how the children of this land, who were our fathers, held them back. Of these I will speak first, and praise their valor, as is meet and fitting. He who would rightly estimate them should place himself in thought at that time when the whole of Asia was subject to the third king of Persia. The first king, Cyrus, 
by his valour freed the Persians, who were his countrymen, and subjected the Medes, who were their lords, and he ruled over the rest of Asia as far as Egypt, and after him came his son, who ruled all the accessible part of Egypt and Libya. The third king was Darius, who extended the land boundaries of the empire to Scythia, and with his fleet held the sea and the islands. None presumed to be his equal. The minds of all men were enthralled by him. So many and mighty and warlike nations had the power of Persia subdued. Now Darius had a quarrel against us and the Eritreans, because, as he said, we had conspired against Sardis, and he sent five hundred thousand men in transports and vessels of war, and three hundred ships, and Datis as commander, telling him to bring the Eritreans and Athenians to the king if he wished to keep his head on his shoulders. He sailed against the Eritreans, who were reputed to be amongst the noblest and most warlike of the Hellenes of that day, and they were numerous, but he conquered them all in three days, and when he had conquered them, in order that no one might escape, he searched the whole country after this manner, his soldiers, coming to the borders of Eritrea, and spreading from sea to sea, joined hands, and passed through the whole country, in order that they might be able to tell the king that no one had escaped them. And from Eritrea they went to Marathon, with a like intention, expecting to bind the Athenians in the same yoke of necessity in which they had bound the Eritreans. Having effected one half of their purpose, they were in the act of attempting the other, and none of the Hellenes dared to assist either the Eritreans or the Athenians, except the Lacedaemonians, and they arrived a day too late for the battle. But the rest were panic-stricken, and kept quiet, too happy in having escaped for a time. He who has present to his mind that conflict will know what manner of men they were who received the onset of the barbarians at Marathon, and chastened the pride of the whole of Asia, and by the victory which they gained over the barbarians, first taught other men that the power of the Persians was not invincible, but that hosts of men and the multitude of riches alike yield to valor. And I assert that those men are the fathers not only of ourselves, but of our liberties, and of the liberties of all who are on the continent, for that was the action to which the Hellenes looked back when they ventured to fight for their own safety in the battles which ensued. They became disciples of the men of Marathon. To them, therefore, I assign in my speech the first place, and the second to those who fought and conquered in the sea fights at Salamis and Artemisium, for of them too one might have many things to say, of the assaults which they endured by sea and land, and how they repelled them. I will mention only that act of theirs which appears to me to be the noblest, and which followed that of Marathon, and came nearest to it. For the men of Marathon only showed the Hellenes that it was possible to ward off the barbarians by land, the many by the few, but there was no proof that they could be defeated by ships. And at sea the Persians retained the reputation of being invincible in numbers and wealth and skill and strength. This is the glory of the men who fought at sea, that they dispelled the second terror which had hitherto possessed the Hellenes, and so made the fear of numbers, whether of ships or men, to cease among them. And so the soldiers of Marathon and the sailors of Salamis became the schoolmasters of Hellas, the one teaching and habituating the Hellenes not to fear the barbarians at sea, and the others not to fear them by land. Third in order, for the number and valour of the combatants, and third in the salvation of Hellas, I place the battle of Plataea. And now the Lacedaemonians, as well as the Athenians, took part in the struggle. They were all united in this greatest and most terrible conflict of all. Wherefore their virtues will be celebrated in times to come, as they are now celebrated by us. But at a later period many Hellenic tribes were still on the side of the barbarians, and there was a report that the great king was going to make a new attempt upon the Hellenes, and therefore justice requires that we should also make mention of those who crowned the previous work of our salvation, 
and drove and purged away all barbarians from the sea. These were the men who fought by sea at the river Eurymedon, and who went on the expedition to Cyprus, and who sailed to Egypt and diverse other places, and they should be gratefully remembered by us, because they compelled the king, in fear for himself, to look to his own safety instead of plotting the destruction of Hellas. And so the war against the barbarians was fought out to the end by the whole city on their own behalf, and on behalf of their countrymen. There was peace, and our city was held in honour, and then, as prosperity makes men jealous, there succeeded a jealousy of her, and jealousy begat envy, and so she became engaged against her will in a war with the Hellenes. On the breaking out of war, our citizens met the Lacedaemonians at Tanagra, and fought for the freedom of the Boeotians. The issue was doubtful, and was decided, by the engagement which followed. For when the Lacedaemonians had gone on their way, leaving the Boeotians, whom they were aiding, on the third day, after the battle of Tanagra, our countrymen conquered at Onofuta, and righteously restored those who had been unrighteously exiled. And they were the first, after the Persian war, who fought on behalf of liberty in aid of Hellenes against Hellenes. They were brave men, and freed those whom they aided, and were the first two who were honorably interred in this sepulchre by the state. Afterwards there was a mighty war in which all the Hellenes joined, and devastated our country, which was very ungrateful of them, and our countrymen, after defeating them in a naval engagement, and taking their leaders, the Spartans, at Sphagia, when they might have destroyed them, spared their lives, and gave them back, and made peace, considering that they should war with their fellow countrymen only until they gained a victory over them, and not, because of the private anger of the state, destroy the common interest of Hellas, but that with barbarians they should war to the death. Worthy of praise are they also who waged this war, and are here interred, for they proved, if any one doubted, the superior prowess of the Athenians in the former war with the barbarians, that their doubts had no foundation, showing by their victory in the civil war with Hellas, in which they subdued the other chief state of the Hellenes, that they could conquer single-handed those with whom they had been allied in the war against the barbarians. After the peace there followed a third war, which was of a terrible and desperate nature, and in this many brave men who are here interred lost their lives. Many of them had won victories in Sicily, whither they had gone over the seas to fight for the liberties of the Leontines, to whom they were bound by oaths, but owing to the distance the city was unable to help them, and they lost heart, and came to misfortune, of whom their very enemies give a higher praise for temperance and valour than friends do of most other men. Many also fell in naval engagements at the Hellespont, after having in one day taken all the ships of the enemy, and defeated them in other naval engagements. And what I call the terrible and desperate nature of the war is that the other Hellenes, in their extreme animosity towards the city, should have entered into negotiations with their bitterest enemy, the king of Persia, whom they, together with us, had expelled. Him, without us, they again brought back, barbarian against Hellenes, and all the hosts, both of Hellenes and barbarians, were united against Athens. And then shone forth the power and valour of our city. Her enemies had supposed that she was exhausted by the war, and our ships were blockaded at Mytilene. But the citizens themselves embarked and came to the rescue with sixty other ships, and their valour was confessed of all men, for they conquered their enemies and delivered their friends. And yet by some evil fortune they were left to perish at sea, and therefore are not interred here. Ever to be remembered and honoured are they, for by their valour not only that sea fight was won for us, but the entire war was decided by them, and through them the city gained the reputation of being invincible, even though attacked by all mankind. And that reputation was a true one, for the defeat which came upon us was our own doing. We were never conquered by others, and to this day we are still unconquered by them. But we were our own conquerors, and received defeat at our own hands. 
afterwards there was quiet and peace abroad, but there sprang up war at home, and if men are destined to have civil war, no one could have desired that his city should take the disorder in a milder form. How joyful and natural was the reconciliation of those who came from the Piraeus and those who came from the city! With what moderation did they order the war against the tyrants in Eleusis, and in a manner how unlike what the other Hellenes expected! And the reason of this gentleness was the veritable tie of blood which created among them a friendship as of kinsmen, faithful not in word only but in deed. And we ought also to remember those who then fell by one another's hands, and on such occasions as these, to reconcile them with sacrifices and prayers, praying to those who have power over them, that they may be reconciled even as we are reconciled. For they did not attack one another out of malice or enmity, but they were unfortunate. And that such was the fact we ourselves are witnesses, who are of the same race with them, and have mutually received and granted forgiveness of what we have done and suffered. After this there was perfect peace, and the city had rest, and her feeling was that she forgave the barbarians, who had severely suffered at her hands, and severely retaliated, but that she was indignant at the ingratitude of the Hellenes, when she remembered how they had received good from her, and returned evil, having made common cause with the barbarians, depriving her of the ships which had once been their salvation, and dismantling our walls which had preserved their own from falling. She thought that she would no longer defend the Hellenes, when enslaved either by one another or by the barbarians, and did accordingly. This was our feeling, while the Lacedaemonians were thinking that we who were the champions of liberty had fallen, and that their business was to subject the remaining Hellenes. And why should I say more? For the events of which I am speaking happened not long ago, and we can all of us remember how the chief peoples of Hellas, Argives, and Boeotians, and Corinthians came to feel the need of us, and, what is the greatest miracle of all, the Persian king himself was driven to such extremity as to come round to the opinion that from this city, of which he was the destroyer, and from no other, his salvation would proceed. And if a person desired to bring a deserved accusation against our city, he would find only one charge, which he could justly urge, that she was too compassionate and too favourable to the weaker side, and in this instance she was not able to hold out or keep her resolution of refusing aid to her injurers when they were being enslaved, but she was softened, and did in fact send out aid and delivered the Hellenes from slavery, and they were free until they afterwards enslaved themselves. Whereas to the great king she refused to give the assistance of the state, for she could not forget the trophies of Marathon and Salamis and Plataea, but she allowed exiles and volunteers to assist him, and they were his salvation. And she herself, when she was compelled, entered into the war, and built walls and ships, and fought with the Lacedaemonians on behalf of the Parians. Now the king, fearing this city and wanting to stand aloof, when he saw the Lacedaemonians growing weary of the war at sea, asked of us, as the price of his alliance with us and the other allies, to give up the Hellenes in Asia, whom the Lacedaemonians had previously handed over to him, he thinking that we should refuse, and that then he might have a pretense for withdrawing from us. About the other allies he was mistaken, for the Corinthians and Argives and Boeotians and the other states were quite willing to let them go, and swore and covenanted that if he would pay them money they would make over to him the Hellenes of the continent, and we alone refused to give them up and swear. Such was the natural nobility of this city, so sound and healthy was the spirit of freedom among us, and the instinctive dislike of the barbarian, because we are pure Hellenes, having no admixture of barbarism in us for we are not like many others, descendants of Pelops, or Cadmus, or Egyptus, or Danaeus, who are by nature barbarians, and yet pass for Hellenes, and dwell in the midst of us, but we are pure Hellenes, uncontaminated by any foreign element, and therefore the hatred of the foreigner has passed unadulterated into the lifeblood of the city, 
and so, notwithstanding our noble sentiments, we were again isolated because we were unwilling to be guilty of the base and unholy act of giving up Hellenes to barbarians. And we were in the same case as when we were subdued before, but, by the favour of heaven, we managed better, for we ended the war without the loss of our ships, or walls, or colonies. The enemy was only too glad to be quit of us. Yet in this war we lost many brave men, such as were those who fell owing to the ruggedness of the ground at the Battle of Corinth, or by treason at Lechaeum. Brave men too were those who delivered the Persian king, and drove the Lacedaemonians from the sea. I remind you of them, and you must celebrate them together with me, and do honour to their memories. Such were the actions of the men who are here interred, and of others who have died on behalf of their country. Many and glorious things I have spoken of them, and there are yet many more, and more glorious things remaining to be told. Many days and nights would not suffice to tell of them. Let them not be forgotten, and let every man remind their descendants that they also are soldiers who must not desert the ranks of their ancestors, or from cowardice fall behind. Even as I exhort you this day, and in all future time, whenever I meet with any of you, shall continue to remind and exhort you, O ye sons of heroes, that you strive to be the bravest of men. And I think that I ought now to repeat what your fathers desired to have said to you who are their survivors, when they went out to battle, in case anything happened to them. I will tell you what I heard them say, and what, if they had only speech, they would fain be saying, judging from what they then said. And you must imagine that you hear them saying what I now repeat to you. Sons, the event proves that your fathers were brave men, for we might have lived dishonorably, but have preferred to die honorably rather than bring you and your children into disgrace, and rather than dishonor our own fathers and forefathers, considering that life is not life to one who is a dishonor to his race, and that to such a one neither men nor gods are friendly, either while he is on the earth or after death in the world below. Remember our words, then, and whatever is your aim, let virtue be the condition of the attainment of your aim, and know that without this all possessions and pursuits are dishonorable and evil. For neither does wealth bring honor to the owner, if he be a coward. Of such a one the wealth belongs to another, and not to himself. Nor does beauty and strength of body, when dwelling in a base and cowardly man, appear comely, but the reverse of comely, making the possessor more conspicuous, and manifesting forth his cowardice. And all knowledge, when separated from justice and virtue, is seen to be cunning and not wisdom. Wherefore, make this your first and last and constant and all-absorbing aim, to exceed, if possible, not only us, but all your ancestors in virtue. And know that to excel you in virtue only brings us shame, but that to be excelled by you is a source of happiness to us and we shall most likely be defeated, and you will most likely be victors in the contest, if you learn so to order your lives as not to abuse or waste the reputation of your ancestors, knowing that to a man who has any self-respect nothing is more dishonorable than to be honored, not for his own sake, but on account of the reputation of his ancestors. The honor of parents is a fair and noble treasure to their posterity, but to have the use of a treasure of wealth and honor, and to leave none to your successors, because you have neither money nor reputation of your own, is alike base and dishonorable. And if you follow our precepts, you will be received by us as friends, when the hour of destiny brings you hither. But if you neglect our words, and are disgraced in your lives, no one will welcome or receive you. This is the message which is to be delivered to our children. Some of us have fathers and mothers still living, and we would urge them, if, as is likely, we shall die, to bear the calamity as lightly as possible, and not to condole with one another, for they have sorrows enough, and will not need any one to stir them up. While we gently heal their wounds, let us remind them that the gods have heard the chief part of their prayers, for they prayed, not that their children might live forever, 
but that they might be brave and renowned, and this, which is the greatest good, they have attained. A mortal man cannot expect to have everything in his own life turning out according to his will, and they, if they bear their misfortunes bravely, will be truly deemed brave fathers of the brave. But if they give way to their sorrows, either they will be suspected of not being our parents, or we of not being such as our panegyrists declare. Let not either of the two alternatives happen, but rather let them be our chief and true panegyrists, who show in their lives that they are true men, and had men for their sons. Of old the saying, nothing too much, appeared to be, and really was, well said. For he whose happiness rests with himself, if possible, wholly, and if not, as far as is possible, who is not hanging in suspense on other men, or changing with the vicissitude of their fortune, has his life ordered for the best. He is the temperate and valiant and wise, and when his riches come and go, when his children are given and taken away, he will remember the proverb, neither rejoicing over much, nor grieving over much, for he relies upon himself, and such we would have our parents to be. That is our word and wish, and as such we now offer ourselves, neither lamenting over much, nor fearing over much, if we are to die at this time and we entreat our fathers and mothers to retain these feelings throughout their future life, and to be assured that they will not please us by sorrowing and lamenting over us. But if the dead have any knowledge of the living, they will displease us most by making themselves miserable, and by taking their misfortunes too much to heart, and they will please us best if they bear their loss lightly and temperately for our life will have the noblest end which is vouchsafed to man, and should be glorified rather than lamented. And if they will direct their minds to the care and nurture of our wives and children, they will soonest forget their misfortunes, and live in a better and nobler way, and be dearer to us. This is all that we have to say to our families, and to the state we would say, Take care of our parents and of our sons. Let her worthily cherish the old age of our parents, and bring up our sons in the right way. But we know that she will of her own accord take care of them, and does not need any exhortation of ours. This, O ye children and parents of the dead, is the message which they bid us deliver to you, and which I do deliver with the utmost seriousness. And in their name I beseech you, the children, to imitate your fathers, and you, parents, to be of good cheer about yourselves, for we will nourish your age, and take care of you both publicly and privately in any place in which one of us may meet one of you who are the parents of the dead. And the care of you which the city shows, you know yourselves, for she has made provision by law concerning the parents and children of those who die in war. The highest authority is specially entrusted with the duty of watching over them above all other citizens, and they will see that your fathers and mothers have no wrong done to them. The city herself shares in the education of the children, desiring, as far as it is possible, that their orphanhood may not be felt by them. While they are children, she is a parent to them, and when they have arrived at man's estate, she sends them to their several duties in full armor clad, and bringing freshly to their minds the ways of their fathers, she places in their hands the instruments of their father's virtues. For the sake of the omen, she would have them from the first begin to rule over their own houses, arrayed in the strength and arms of their fathers. And as for the dead, she never ceases honoring them, celebrating in common for all rights which become the property of each, and in addition to this, holding gymnastic and equestrian contests and musical festivals of every sort. She is to the dead in the place of a son and heir, and to their sons in the place of a father, and to their parents and elder kindred in the place of a guardian, ever and always caring for them. Considering this, you ought to bear your calamity the more gently, for thus you will be most endeared to the dead and to the living, and your sorrows will heal and be healed. And now do you and all, 
having lamented the dead in common according to the law go your ways you have heard menexenus the oration of aspasia the milesian menexenus truly socrates i marvel that aspasia who is only a woman should be able to compose such a speech she must be a rare one socrates well if you are incredulous you may come with me and hear her menexenus i have often met aspasia socrates and know what she is like socrates well and do you not admire her and are you not grateful for her speech menexenus yes socrates i am very grateful to her or to him who told you and still more to you who have told me socrates very good but you must take care not to tell of me and then at some future time i will repeat to you many other excellent political speeches of hers menexenus fear not only let me hear them and i will keep the secret socrates then i will keep my promise end of menexenus by plato translated by benjamin joet read by geoffrey edwards meta coordinated by anne boulet proof listened by rapunzelina recording in memory of mitchell edwards